So, Father in heaven, we thank you that you are the Lord of truth and the Holy Spirit is truth and your word is truth. And we pray that as we look at this passage today, you will fill our hearts with truth, uh, fill our hearts with obedience and give us insight and wisdom, Lord, to see uh, the sins of this world and to see the truth that you are the one that set up marriage, that you are the one who made male and female, that you are the one that gave the roles of a husband and wife. Help us, Lord, uh, never to depart from these and what you have spoken at the very beginning when you made heavens and earth. So bless us now with your wisdom and your insight and understanding, and we uh, look to you as the Holy One, the Almighty God, uh, the giver, of everything we have on this earth. And we give you praise and thanks for how good you are to us. So bless us, we do pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, we're gonna be looking at Ephesians 5, 22 through uh, the end of the chapter, verse 33. Last week, we looked at um, many of the verses in this chapter when it's discussing um, how Jesus has a purpose for his church. And his purpose is for the church to be holy and white and without spot or wrinkle. And that eventually he will present his church to himself as the bride of Christ. So we look very much forward to that. Uh, the purpose of the church is to uh, edify, be edified, uh, love one another, present the gospel to this world. But uh, through all of that, he is continually working in us to change the sinful parts of us into uh, righteous and holy parts. So uh, that's something that I guess a lot of people don't see as very glorious and, and dynamic and wonderful. But boy, it is. When you see people that had had problems in the past and and they're cleared up because the, of the, having a new nature and you know, having the Holy Spirit work in us to change our attitudes and change our way of thinking uh, from the old ways to the new ways, how he wants. So that's a wonderful thing. Um, and today we're going to be looking at uh, marriage and uh, male and female and husband's role and a wife's role. Uh, we're looking at all this from a certain angle of how the world has taken all of these things and distorted it and lied to us and lied to people. And these lies about marriage and male and female, the husband and wife roles, these things seep from the world into the church, into our thinking. So uh, they must be taught. I heard about a uh, preacher in Canada, he was an old fella, maybe my age, and he was preaching on the street and standing on a soapbox, and he had a crowd of people around him, and well, some, he was preaching from Genesis, that God created male and female, and that they're supposed to get married, and just that, and somebody called the police and said he was speaking hate speech. So they came and arrested him, and they weren't very kind with him, uh, rough, roughing him up, uh, handcuffing him, and taking him to jail for the terrible crime of preaching from the first and second chapter of Genesis. So what kind of a thing is that? Well, the world is uh, becoming very overt. Uh, they're very bold. Uh, they're just out in the open now of denying what God says in his word. You know, too bad for them because the word of God, what God has spoken is going to exist forever. And they're not. <laughs> they're going to be in the lake of fire forever, wishing that they would have obeyed and understood what God said, the gospel, and, and so they could be saved. But um, the world now is just going after the truths of scripture, just full force. And we see it all over the place. Things aren't like they, ain't like they used to be. <laughs> Not at all. Uh, back in, in my teenage years, when I was 18 and got saved and how the world was, and um, it's not like that anymore. And in the last two years, it's changed dramatically. And we're going to look at the reason for that. Um, 
as far as uh, the role of men and women and marriage and uh, all of this, schools have been teaching against this for decades now. And now they're blatantly uh, putting homosexual pornography books in school libraries for kids to read. And we've probably seen these uh, episodes where uh, a woman got up in front of a school board with one of these texts, one of these books that were in the school library and started reading it. And the, 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 the people on the school board said, you can't read that, and they had the police come and get her. She said, I'm reading what you put in the kid's classroom, in the kid's library. And so they took it out, but you know, they put it back. They put them back because these are Satan-led people that are just filthy in their minds. And they're willing to teach kids all the filthiness of this world. And that's where things have gone nowadays. So as the church, we need to take a stand against this stuff. Jude wrote it like this in Jude 1.3. He says, uh, today the church needs to stand up and contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And it's all been written, and there it is, and we have to deliver it to the, not only the saints, but the people of this world. But the church needs to hear what God is saying to the church because the lies are just rampant. So we're going to look at this passage, and we're going to look at it uh, in six different points, but from the viewpoint of how the world is distorting what God says. So we're going to look at the truth about deception. Why are they so deceived? Why do they lie? Why do they think they have to? And, and why do people of the world, when they hear lies, how come they believe them, even when the lies are absolute insanity and craziness? And then we're going to look at the truth about a male and a female. You know, there, there's two, and that's it. And we're going to look at that. There's not, like some people say, hundreds of different combinations of what a person thinks he might be. It doesn't matter what a person thinks he might be. We're all born either with an X or a Y. And, and there's no Z and there's no elemental P. There's only X and a Y, and that's it. And you got one or the other. And all the hormone treatments and surgeries in the world will not change that. That's who we are as a person. It's our DNA. And then we're going to look at the truth about marriage. And then the truth about husbands as being the head of the uh, family, the head of the wife. And then the truth about the wife submitting to the husband. And then how about the truth about the truth? We want to look at that. And then we're going to conclude with Psalm 73, where the psalmist says, that's all I see is the people of this world getting more bold and prospering more, and they never get judged. But I'm trying to live the Christian life, and I just have a terrible time. What's the deal with that? And we're going to look at that and feel very good about uh, being Christians. So the, uh, first of all, the truth about deception. And it all begins with Satan, I guess. Who else, right? Satan in John chapter 8. Jesus is talking to uh, the religious leaders in Israel. And they are claiming that God is their father, that Abraham is their father. And then Jesus, uh, in verse 42, Jesus said to them, If God were your father... You would love me, for I came from God, and I am here. And I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. So why do you not understand what I say? How come they don't understand when Jesus just tells them simple things, that he came from God? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. They don't want to hear it, and they can't hear it. And then he says this, you are of your father, not Abraham, not God, the devil. Your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and that means from the time of creation. He does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. 
When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. That's why people don't hear the truth. That's why they only hear lies. That's so frustrating for a believer to hear constantly the words spouting, the world spouting off more and more, telling us lies about this world and, and about life and about everything. And, um, and the different news places that I look at, like I'll, I'll look at a news station in Sacramento, and it'll say, everything you need to know for today, they're your source of everything. What you need to know about COVID, you'll find it right here. You'll find the truth here. We're the tellers of the truth. When in fact, they're the liars. They're the ones spreading the lies that somebody else is giving to them. You know, it's kind of interesting to watch uh, these little um, videos that people put together when a new lie comes out. Like, like for instance, of the president uh, says, no new taxes. And it'll, it'll, it'll put together about 25 different news shows of all the different people saying, no new taxes. And the lady says, no new taxes. And the man says, no new taxes. And it just goes from the one, they've all been sent the same thing. And they're all just parroting the same lie. And all the people are sitting at home watching that. Huh, well, that's good. No new taxes. Wake up. <laughs> They're lying to you. This is the um, Inflation Ending Act. No, it's Inflation Beginning Act. They get the words wrong. Whatever they say, take the opposite. And then you'll know what the truth is. So the truth about deception, it all begins with Satan. In uh, the Second Corinthians 11, 3 and 4, it talks about the serpent deceiving Eve. And, and Paul is afraid that they're going to be deceived by the serpent too. He's talking to Christians, and he's just praying that they're not going to be deceived. Yeah, Christians can be deceived too. And so let's take a look at Genesis chapter um, 3, where Satan deceived Eve. And deceived, uh, Eve was deceived first. And what does he do? He lies about what God says. Now, if Adam and Eve would have followed what God said, if they would have only eaten from all the trees, and if they would have eaten from the tree of life, and never eaten from the, knowledge of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, this world would be an incredible place. And we'd all be living forever and never growing old and everything that God promised, if we would have done what he said. But no, here comes Satan into the picture. So Genesis 3, verse 1, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, so he got a snake talking to a woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? The first thing he does is call into question what God says. And the woman said to the serpent, now here's a big mistake. She's having a dialogue with the serpent. <laughs> she shouldn't be doing this. We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said you should not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. And that's a lie. Because he knew good and well they were going to die. And that's where uh, Satan is the, the father of all murders. He's a murderer from the beginning. Because he killed Adam and Eve. He knew that they would die. He knew that everybody was going to die after that. So the serpent says to the woman, you will not surely die. But God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Wow. It, it's good for food. It looks okay. And I've forgotten all about what God says, but I want to be wise. I want to have some more knowledge and be like God. And the woman saw the food and she took it and she ate it and she gave it to her husband. And that was it. That was the fall of man. 
man had disobeyed God because he was lied to and he believed the lie rather than the truth. Everything that God tells us is true. If God tells us don't do something and if we do it, you're going to get hurt. If he tells us to do something, we do it, we're going to be blessed. God is truth, and Satan's a liar. So today, 6,000 years ago, it's still going on. And we're being lied to by this new world order, this new government that's, that's being put together. It's Satan's government. It's Satan's new world order that's being put together. So uh, the father of lies. Uh, in the last days, it says in Daniel 7.25, that this Antichrist, the beast, the lawless one, he's going to speak words against the Most High, against the Most High. And then in Daniel 11.36, he shall speak astonishing things against the God of gods. That's why people nowadays are speaking so boldly against God and against his word and against his people. That's why. Because Satan's time is coming when the whole world is going to be following him, following all of his lies, that he's going to be speaking against God. This uh, new, um, new World Order, one of the leading proponents of that whole thing is the World Economic Forum. And it was uh, started by Klaus Schwab. And he has different views than God does of what the world should be. And one of his views is that uh, the world shouldn't be so populated, that it needs to be reduced by about 7.5 billion people. So they are on the march to kill people because we're just useless eaters. We're worthless. Um, only the top scientists and the really smart ones, they should be the only ones allowed to live in the world. And, and enough mindless little robotic people, uh, the ones that they can't use a machine to replace, they actually intend to put chips into people and make them part machine and not all human. And they, so I hear, are already doing it. So they are, one of their um, chief advisors, maybe their main chief advisor, uh, what this guy said, says a lot of things, but one of the things he said was that the whole idea about Jesus being the savior and dying and rising again from the dead, that's fake news. There's no truth to that. We shouldn't even... Uh, have that it shouldn't have any place in our lives. We're going to eradicate it from this earth, and that's what they plan on doing. Except one day, God is going to eradicate them from this earth. They got it backwards. <laughs> in Romans 1.18, it says that people suppress the truth. It's, God says when they look outside and they see all of creation, that that tells them that somebody all-powerful made all of this. It didn't happen by itself. We don't have air to breathe just because it's here. <laughs> we, somebody had to have made the air. We don't have all the water that we have without somebody making it. Nowhere else in the whole universe that we can see has our air or has our water. doesn't need to because we're the only ones that are human living on this planet. And God says, you're without excuse if you think that this came all by itself. And that's one of the big lies. Uh, evolution. There is no truth to it. It is entirely a lie. And our kids are taught that, and it's just Im they're just immersed in it all the way through school. It says in Romans that these people will, they will trade the truth, exchange the truth about God for a lie. And they'll, they'll worship the world. They'll worship the planet instead of the God who made the planet. They worship the creature instead of the creator. And, and they will not believe the truth. They're just committed to it. Uh, in the coming uh, time, uh, this tribulation time, this new world order putting together their s religious system, 
it says that Satan and his, uh, is going to be doing false signs and wonders. It talks about wicked deception. These people refused to love the truth. They didn't believe the truth. And these are the people that are going to be so de easily deceived. They're going to even have an angel flying around the world, a literal angel, broadcasting with a loud voice in whatever your language is to tell you that if you take this mark on your hand or the forehead, you will be in eternal flames forever and ever. That's going to happen. And what does everybody in the world do, almost everybody? They take the mark. And then someday they're going to die and they're going to be in hell forever. They don't obey the truth. God keeps yelling the truth to people, but people of the world don't want to hear it. In Revelation 12, 9, this great dragon was thrown down. He's called the ancient serpent. Why? He's the serpent that talked to Eve and deceived her. It's he who is called the devil and he's called Satan. It says he's a deceiver of the whole world, and so he is. He's deceiving everybody in this world. Uh, in Je uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 3, when he's finally thrown into this pit for a thousand years and locked up, it says he's thrown in so he won't deceive the nations any longer. And for a thousand years, the nations won't be deceived. But at the end of a thousand years, they let him out, and all the nations go, all right, we're ready for battle against God. Who would go figure? Revelation 20.10 says the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire. Finally, he gets his due. Finally, it be the end of him. He won't be deceiving anybody any longer. He's nothing but a liar. In Revelation 13.4, it's the uh, false prophet that goes out deceiving all those who dwell on the earth saying, you better take the mark. You better worship the image. If you don't, you're going to die. Well, it'd be better to die saved and be in heaven forever than be in hell forever just to stay alive for a few more years. From that point on, there's just three and a half years left until Christ comes back. And at the end of all this, Jesus says, Oh, all of the liars in this world, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. That's Revelation 21.8. That's their portion. That's where they're going to be. The ones that said, oh, take the mark or you'll die. They're going to be there with their mark forever and ever. And all the ones that did take it, that they trusted Christ as their Savior, they're going to be in, in the glorious heaven forever and ever. When Jesus was asked about the signs of the end times, the first thing he says is, don't let anybody lead you astray. Don't do it. And that's his message today. Don't let anybody lead you astray. Well, that's the truth about lies. Well, how about the truth about male and female? God says in Genesis chapter 1, he's the creator, he's creating Adam and Eve, and in Genesis 1, 26, he says, God said, let us, who's the us? So you've got a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heaven, over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created them, male and female, he created them. So when I grew up, I didn't know the Bible, but I knew I was a boy. And when I got to be about 12 or 13, I knew there were girls. Boys and girls, and that's all there was. Until a couple of years ago, now we got a lot of different stuff. 
Now on your driver's license, you don't even have to say if you're a male or female anymore. You can just, you know, whatever the other box is. And, and now different places have all these different genders that you can pick, all these combinations. Well, the truth is that man was made first. This is the science of the whole thing. This is the truth. Is that man was made with an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. That's his DNA. And he was made first. And then woman was made from him. And a woman only has an X chromosome and her DNA. She only has the female one. The X one is the female one. Well, she couldn't have been made first because she didn't have a Y one. Adam had to have been made first. He had the X and the Y, both of them. So then when the woman was made, she has the X one. So now a man and the woman, when they get together, they either produce an X one or a Y one. And there isn't an LMNOP ones. They don't have all these other ones. That's the truth. And I've told this before, we were at the, the water one day and uh, Annabelle was sitting by me and these two ducks came, a beautiful mallard with a shiny greenish, bluish uh, neck that as it turned in the sunlight, it would turn beautiful colors. And then the female, this is kind of drab looking, but she's pretty too. And they're a couple. And there were several couples. And you see them and I said, you see the, the duck with the pretty? Well, that's the boy duck. And you see the other duck? That's the girl duck. And they're, they're, they're like husband and wife ducks. And that's all there is. There's only the boy and there's only the girl. You don't have all these other kind of ducks. And so it is with all the animals in the world. <laughs> well, uh, when we look at the Bible, we see that God said he made them male and female. And the world says, no, he didn't. And to the world, I say, you liar. Don't lie. Tell the truth. Or they can't tell the truth. Now they want to take people that tell the truth and, and put us in jail or fine us or kill us because we're telling the truth. And they cannot stand God's truth. They only love Satan's truth. And that's all they want to hear. So in Genesis chapter 5, some very interesting things happen that just confirms what God did in, in when he created people. He created a male and female. So in Genesis 5, verse 1, it says, This book of the generations of Adam, when God created man, he made him in his likeness of God, male and female, he created them, and he blessed them, and he named them man, and when they were created, when Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image, and he named him Seth. And the days of Adam, and after that, he followed Seth, were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. He didn't have sons and part daughters and part sons and uh, some of the sons became daughters and some of the daughters figured out they were really sons. No! He had sons and daughters. And that's it. And, and for then, you know, that's the truth. And for thousands of years, it's been okay until now. And I shared that a video's out there. Look at it. Here's a vice president sitting at a table at the head of it with all these other women all with their masks on. And, and she says, uh, she's announcing and telling people that are going to be viewing it, I guess. She says, my name is Kamala Harris and I'm the vice president and, um, and I am a woman and my pronouns are she and her and I'm wearing a blue dress. And you're thinking if Biden goes, you're going to be our leader? You're going to tell people that you think you're a woman and, and that your pronouns are... We know what your pronouns are. We can see you. You're a woman. And why do you got to look at your dress before you can... You know, you forgot what you put on that morning. I don't know. It's crazy. And it's insane. We keep saying insane and crazy, and it is. It's insanity. It's crazy. But that's where this world is just jamming down everybody's throats. And it will not recognize the fact that 
men and women have kids, and is it a boy or a girl? You got pink and you got blue. Which one is it? That's what there is. And then if you keep going down through this chapter, you got all these men having all these kids, and then it names some of them, and then it says they had more sons and daughters behind, beside that. How many kids can you have if you live to be 900? I bet a lot. <laughs> and how about in Genesis chapter 6, verse 19, when the flood is going to come because all the people have, have gotten so evil and God is telling Noah, I'm going to bring all these animals into the ark. And in verse 19, he says, In every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Yeah, because afterwards, when they get out of the ark, if they want to populate and all the, all the, you want more robins in the world, they got to bring a boy robin and a girl robin. I guess it, it just seems so clear. And when this world is telling us different and saying we're in trouble for believing what is so clear, I just say, I'm ready to go. <laughs> Come on, God, anytime. Get me out of this world. Here we go. We're going to fly away and let this world have it. <laughs> it needs to. So now, this is the way God made it at the beginning. Has it always kept up that way? This is the favorite thing they want to say. The Bible's really old. And it's got to get up with the times. These are the times. This is the way things are now. Really? Well, let's jump ahead from the time that God created them and all the people were having boys and girls, and all the animals were going boys and girls, and let's jump ahead 4,000 years when somebody asked Jesus a question when he's here on earth. And they asked Jesus, what about divorce? And in Matthew chapter 19, verse 3, he says, the Pharisees came to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Here's his answer well, how do you really know if she's a wife? <laughs> you know, there was not, none of this. <laughs> what he says is, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And he said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and behold and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh, what therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. What did it look like at the beginning, guys? And you, then you want to know the truth? There it is. God already said it. <clears throat> this is the system that he set up for people. You have a male and a female, and when they get married, they become one flesh. Exactly like you said 4,000 years earlier, it has not changed. How about 2,000 years later? It has not changed. Oh, wait, it has because some bureaucrat and scientist and a bunch of lying people on TV say it has. No, it hasn't. It hasn't changed and it never will be. Malachi 3.6 says, For I, the Lord, do not change. One time, <coughs> Melody was talking to um, a woman pastor two women pastors, actually, assistant pastor and pastor, and they were discussing homosexuality, <clears throat> and the people said, well, that was for back then. It's a different culture today. I, the Lord, do not change. <laughs> no, it's the same. 4,000 years. Jesus said, what did he say? Male and female, get married. It hasn't changed. Peter says, the word of the Lord remains forever. And so it does. It doesn't change. <clears throat> it doesn't fade away. <clears throat> it doesn't grow old. But the word of our God stands forever. Isaiah 40, verse 8. It stands forever. So how about the truth about marriage? It's the same thing as it was in the beginning. He told Adam and Eve, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. That word hold fast is like super glue. 
He needs to be glued to his wife. The two will become one. And so they're no longer two, but one flesh. What God has joined together, let not man separate. That is marriage. And people are supposed to be married. Men and women are to be married. Not men and men. Not women and women. And not whatever else they think there is. What about two people living together? In almost every church, every good evangelical Bible teaching church, there's men and women living together. In John 4... Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, a Samaritan woman, because he cared for her. Even though she was a woman and she was from Samaria, they hated the Jews, the Jews hated him. He said, you need to know Christ. So he talks to her. And in the process of the conversation, he says to the woman, go call your husband and bring him here. And the woman said, I don't have a husband. She was truthful. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying I have no husband because you have had five husbands. And the one you, that you're with now, he's not your husband. What you've said is true. She goes running off into the city and says, there's a man here that told me everything about my life. He knows all about me and I never met him. This has got to be the Messiah, right? <laughs> and they all come out to see and she, they see Jesus, and he presents himself to them. And then they say, you know, we don't believe in you just because of this woman and what she said. We believe in you because we, you're the Messiah, and we're trusting you to save us from our sins now. But Jesus said, the guy you're living with, he's not your husband. So if people are living together, and they're not married, they're not married. <laughs> One time, somebody came to me and they said, we would like you to marry us. And I said, well, you mean like a remarriage dedication thing? And because I saw on Facebook, you're married. And they said, well, what we really did was kind of get down on our knees and marry ourselves before God. But we need to really be married. <laughs> so, so we married them. They felt guilty. They felt sinful. They needed to really be married. What God has joined together. Jesus went to a, a wedding in Cana. The very first miracle that he did. They ran out of wine and he said take some water. And he took the water and they made it into wine. It was a very wonderful wine. They said it's the best wine and you saved it for last. He, he said weddings are good. Marriage is good. People need to be married and I, I've heard people in the church say, it's nothing but a piece of paper. Well, you need the piece of paper. You do. You need to have a wedding. You need to be married. And whatever the customs uh, and culture of your country are, God doesn't go into that because everybody has their own way. But everybody needs to be married. So marriage is ordained by God. There's something that he wants. And also, there's the whole aspect of the marriage of the Lamb, where the church is God's bride, that Jesus is bride, and he is the Lamb of God. And in the book of Revelation, the church marries Jesus as the Lamb of God. They had a ceremony, and it's coming up soon to be. And there is a thing that takes place. Every couple needs that. If they're going to be married, they have to have the, the piece of paper and the ceremony. And you can't just go along with the world and say, well, marriage isn't that important. It is. And then there is the, the truth about husbands as the head of the home. And the part about the husbands and the wife, we're going to go into a lot of detail next week talking about the duties of a husband, of loving his wife like Christ loved the church, giving himself up for the wife, and then the wife submitting herself to the husband. But as far as the husband, primarily it's that God made Adam first. He made Eve second. And just because of that, the husband is the head of the home. I think the husband is viewed today, men are viewed like this, well, 
They don't belong the head of anything. <laughs> they're stupid. They're lazy. They're self-centered. They're a bunch of beer-drinking, TV-watching slugs. <laughs> they watch TV sitcoms, and, and you see TV sitcoms, and uh, I remember that one, The Jeffersons. There were funny stuff. I liked that show. But that his wife, Wheezy, oh, my goodness, she just, her husband was just a blooming idiot. <laughs> That's all. He couldn't do anything right, and she was always yelling at him. And uh, the, the Cosby show, the guy was a doctor, and, and he was an idiot too. He couldn't do anything right. I just saw one episode where the sink linked and leaked in the kitchen, and he was trying to fix it, and she kept telling him, call somebody, you're too much of an idiot to fix it. All the men, Homer Simpson, there you go, a bunch of idiots. Bumbling fools. And that's what the world wants everybody to think. God says the man is the head of the home. He's in charge under God. And the world says, no, he's not. The woman's in charge. She's the one that should be taken over. That's not the way God made it. The world is a liar. God's word is true. So next week, we're really going to go over what it is for the husband to be the head of the home. And then the woman is to submit to her husband. And I, I have heard people say, uh, when I ask them what their wedding vows is, we don't want to do this one. We will not say this one where the wife will submit to the husband because we won't do that. And they're believers. They've been infiltrated by the junk of this world. Believe what God says. That's the way it's supposed to be. The wives are supposed to submit their the husbands. Why do I say that? Because that's just what the Bible says. It says, wives, submit to your own husbands. Your own husbands. It's not women submitting to men. It's not Islam. The woman submits to their own husband as to the Lord. If the husband's loving his wife as himself, and as Christ loved the church, she will be more than willing to submit to that kind of leadership. And that's what it needs to be in the homes today. Just that. So wives, submit to your husbands. It's interesting that when, when Eve was created out of Adam, Adam was taken from the dirt. The beasts of the field were created out of the dirt. Eve was not created out of the dirt. She was created out of man. And it says rib, but that word is really side. And it, it's used when we're talking about the side of a building. It's the side of something. It's the side of man. So the woman is submitting to the man, but does that mean she's lesser and not equal? No, she's on the same length as him. She's on the same par with him. Uh, together, they're both made in the image of God. Un under God's eyes, they're man and woman. They're human beings. And so she's not less at all. You know, so many Christian books that I have, at the beginning of them, most of them say, I could not have written this book without my wonderful wife's help. And, and that's the way it is. Uh, I couldn't have gone along. I couldn't do anything without her. You know, when God created the heavens and the earth, he said, it is good. And then when he created a Adam and Eve, now there's human beings, he said, it's very good. And then after Adam was made, he said, it's not so good anymore. It's not good for a man to be alone. He needs a helper. And so he created Eve to be his helper. Why? Because he needs a helper. <laughs> I, I heard of um, a real prominent Bible teacher who I respect a lot. And when he was single, he had his apartment, and he had his table with all of his books and notes and everything all over the place. And he finally met a woman, that, and they wanted to get married. And he said, the first time I brought her over to my house, I was so excited and said, isn't this cool? You know, look at my library. Isn't this great? And she says, no, it's not. <laughs> Your place is a dump. <laughs> you need to clean it up. And so he said that was the beginning of her helping me, helping me to be presentable and normal and <laughs> a lot of things. <laughs> She's a helper. Who else is the helper? Jesus said, I'm going to send my helper to you, the Holy Spirit. We need helpers. And why does man need a helper? Because he needs help. Face it. Okay. 
And then uh, finally, the truth about truth. First of all, in Hebrews 6.18, it is impossible for God to lie. Just as it's impossible for Satan to tell the truth, there is zero truth in him. All he can do is take a little bit of truth and twist it and make a lie out of it. And we've seen that in Genesis and all through the Bible. He uses scripture at Jesus' temptation to get Jesus to sin. He'll use scripture, but he'll twist it. He cannot tell the truth. Uh, in John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the truth. And in John 17, 17, the word of God is truth. And then John 16, 13, when the spirit comes, the spirit of truth, he will guide you into all truth. At the end of the book of Revelation, when the angel's talking to John, and now the whole thing is, is almost over. Now they're in the beautiful, eternal kingdom. He says, all of these words are trustworthy and true. The world can't say that. The news shows say, the news you can trust. No, it's lies you can't trust. So I'll say this, uh, um, one time I saw a nurse being interviewed and she was telling about the lies that had gone out about COVID. And at one point she says, if you want COVID to go away, turn off your TV and it'll go away. And you won't be constantly reminded of it day in and day out, on and on and on. One time I was sitting in a waiting room somewhere and uh, the news was on, and it was just COVID, COVID, COVID. Scare, 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 one thing after another. God tells the truth, always tells the truth. God says in Romans 3, 4, let God be true, but every man a liar. And so every man is a liar, and God is the one that tells the truth. I'm so glad that he tells the, me the truth. I don't want to be deceived. I don't want to deceive anybody. I only want to know his truth. I have to know it. I, it's in my heart to know exactly what he says and to convey that, to let God's truth come out so that we'll know what the truth is. In Psalm 73, the psalmist is really bothered by the success of the liars, the success of the evil people of this world. And, and he is asking God, God, I, I think I'm going to fall. I think I'm going to make a ruin of my life. And it goes like this, Psalm 73. He says, truly... There's the truth. Truly, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps nearly slipped. And why did he almost fall in his walk with God? For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And we see that now. Crime after crime after crime. And what happens? Nothing. Nothing. I remember during the Obama days, all the time, oh, he's broken the Constitution now. He's going to go down for this. And finally somebody said, he could murder babies on the White House lawn and nothing would happen to him on TV because nothing ever happens to them. But then people that don't do anything, they make up stuff about him and they go to prison. And this psalmist is saying, why do I just have to suffer trying to do what is right when these guys do everything wrong? And look how good it is for them. Nothing bad ever happens to them. So he says of this wicked, the prosperity of the wicked, he says, for they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They're not in trouble as others are. They're, they're not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, they wear pride like a necklace. And violence just covers them like a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and they speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression to people. 
They set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongue struts through the whole earth. And that's a picture of the Antichrist. He's going to be railing against the heavens and God in it and the people in it. Therefore, the people turn back to them, and they find no fault in them. And how can they say, can, they say, how can God know? Is there any knowledge with the Most High? I'm getting away with all of this. <laughs> behold, behold, they are wicked, always at ease. They increase in their riches. I saw the other day somebody in Congress goes in with a little bit of money, comes out a multimillionaire. <laughs> Their riches increase. All in vain I have kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. <clears throat> For all day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed your generation or children. He almost fell. He almost fell for this, the prosperity of the wicked. And then he says, but when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a worrisome task. Hey, you can't make sense of it all until what happened. I went into the sanctuary of God, and then I discovered their end. When I went into before God, then he helped me to see clearly. Oh, they're prospering, and you're just living down here in all life's trouble, having a hard time trying to live clean, right life, and they're living just all the sins they want. I went into the house of God and I went, uh-oh. They're in trouble, not me. He says, truly, you have set them in slippery places. You will make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when you arouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pierced in my heart, I was like a brute and I was ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. And you're, you hold me by my right hand. He sees that God is his friend. For all of us trying to do good, God loves him and is with him. These other people were on a slippery slope to destruction. He says, you guide me with your counsel upon me, and afterwards you're going to receive me to glory. Whom am I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord my refuge that I may tell of all your wonderful works. He goes into the temple and he sees God. And he says, God, I want you. Nothing on this earth is worth being apart from you. And now I see the prosperity of these wicked ones they're all going to destruction. And that's what we're seeing on our planet today. The prosperity of the lawless ones. And the suffering under their hand of the innocent, the godly ones. But in the end, he says, God holds me through life with his right hand. He holds my hand as I walk through this life. And that's what I want. I want him. And nothing on earth compares to being with him. And that should be our attitude as we see the lies that go out about God and his people and his word, trying to change the word of God into filth and smut and whatever. We can say, well, that's the way the world's going, but God is the strength of my heart. He's the one that is my friend. I'm going to stick with him. And I'll be glad I did. Let's pray together. So, Father in heaven, we thank you for the clarity of your word that shows us the truth about the prosperity of the unrighteous and the, the, the glorious end of the, the goodness that you give to those that walk with you. Thank you that you do counsel us with your eye upon us, that you do watch over us, and we pray that our trust 
will be in you. Help us to learn more and more every day the goodness of you, our God. So fix these things in our minds and our hearts and help us, Lord, to accept your truth as it was from the beginning, that you never change and your words never fade away. And no matter what this world says, Lord, help us to hold on to the truth. We thank you for showing us what is right and good. And so we commit ourselves to you in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen.